Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum again to everyone. Um, so inshallah, ta'ala, we will begin. Um, just as a reintroduction, our first speaker for, um, uh, within the span, inshallah ta'ala, of less than an hour, we'll be able to conclude. But our first speaker will be Brother Malik Datardina. Uh, he is a CISA and a CA, so he has um, both certification in the uh, realm of uh, data security in IT and as well as um, chartered accountancy and he will speak inshallah about the education system as a whole that will be followed by brother Salah Rasul who is the uh, principal at Isna High School who will explain the experiences of uh, uh, you know Muslims and the environment of, of an Islamic high school itself and basically the lessons we can take away from that and we'll conclude with Imam Hussam who is informed he is almost here uh, of, and he's the Imam of Mountain Masjid as most of you probably know and he will give us practical steps we can take to actually address um, sort of the issue of uh, you know education itself going forward. So, with that, I'd like to call uh, Brother Malik Tadzina. Wassalam. <sighs> So and another thing, just uh, I'm also a teacher. I also teach at the University of Waterloo. I teach in the master's program in my my area of uh, uh, expertise, which is uh, you know IT assurance and and uh, audit as well. So I am also a teacher. Uh, so what the, my my presentation, what it's about, is the roots of schooling, or like what is the uh, origins of schooling. Um, by way of agenda, what I want to discuss, like I want to look at the youth of today the youth of yesterday, um, and then explore the kind of the impact of schooling, because there's quite a difference when you look at the youth of today versus the youth of the past, right, and ask ourselves why. And really, what I don't want this to be like an academic talk, just me talking to you academically about the schooling system, because I, you know, I did some research, uh, read books by uh, an author by the name of John Taylor Gatto. Uh, he's uh, a lot of the work I, you will see in my presentations actually from him. Uh, he was a, a New York school teacher for 30 years, and he won lots of awards. He was like top-rated teacher when he was teaching at university. But I just I don't want this to be like an academic academic talk, just talking about his ideas. I want to ask ourselves, you know, this is the impact of schooling, and what's and what's what is your vision for our, for our kids? What's what's the vision we have for our children? So when we look at the youth of today, what how do we characterize them? You know, bored, they're you know unambitious, distracted, aloof, lack maturity. You know, I'm not talking about just uh, like I'm not talking about specific children. I'm not talking about Muslim kids or non-Muslim kids. But in general, this is this is sort of what you find today, right? And if you look at the youth of the past, you know, look at someone like Osama bin Zayd, may Allah be pleased with him. You know, he was leading an army at 17, right? You look at Imam Shafi, rahimullah, he was uh, a scholar uh, at 14 before he hit puberty. So when people used to, he, when people used to come to get fat, fatwa from him, from him or like opinions, uh, they were there, he would tell them that this is binding on you, but it's not binding on me because he hadn't hit puberty yet, right? So this is kind of the caliber of the youth of the past. So some may say that, okay, well, these are great Muslims they're from the past, you know, Osama bin Zayd, these are Sahaba, so these are kind of the reasons why there's such a difference between the youth of today. But let me look at some more youth of the past a little bit closer. So there's Thomas Edison. Uh, he never went to school. Uh, at 15, he was uh, actually publishing a newspaper for railroad workers. He was, he was uh, studying it and actually publishing and circulating it for railroad workers. At 12, he had started his own business selling candy on trains and things like that. Then we look at Benjamin Franklin. He was apprenticing at 12 um, in pre-colonial America you know, with his brother in his print shop. And this next guy, is he was uh, David Farragut. He was a, uh, a, a naval captain. He started in the Navy at 9. At nine years old, he was in the Navy. And they actually asked him to go bring back a ship from South America, bring it back to Boston Harbor at 12. So it doesn't, exp so, the, so the people saying that, oh, these are like, uh, like, like you, you see like a century separate uh, between Osama bin Zayd and someone like uh, David Farragut. Uh, and yet they're the same sort of, it's not abnormal for young people to be serving in the army and leading the army. So, you know, what happened? So as I said, you know, before I get to answer that question, again, what's their vision for our kids, right? You know, and how do we equip them? And I want this question to be in your mind as I go through the kind of the presentation, as I kind of walk you through what I've learned about, about the origins of schooling. So the answer is that what has happened is forced schooling. Uh, schooling came about in America in about 1905, 1915. 
and it's it's actually from uh, imported from Germany, which is ironic because America and you know Germany had beefs with each other, and you know they went to war with each other. But uh, it actually is from Prussia, which is one of the Germanic states, which later became like United and formed Germany, right? And so you may say this is strange. You're like, how can forced schooling actually make people like childless? Like you know you know you would think that if if you force people to school and you force them to learn, that people will be more educated, right? So what we can do is we can study look at the impact that schooling had on literacy. Right? How did, how did forced schooling in America impact literacy over the, over the decades? So if you begin, uh, uh, if you look at illiteracy rates amongst the U.S. Army, like people who enlisted in the U.S. Army, because in the U.S. Army you have to, and you know, as you would expect, you have to be able to read instructions, right? Like you have to look at safety instructions. So if you can't read, you can't, really, you can't serve in the Army, right? So if you look at the 1930s, remember I said, that schooling started became a mainstream around 1915, right? So we have about 2% illiteracy rates. So only 2% of the people that enlisted couldn't read. So you go to 1940s, World War II, how many, it actually goes up, you know, uh, it goes up to 4%. So this is kind of strange, right? Because if, if forced schooling is being introduced, and you know, you should expect literacy to go down. So what happens uh, next time, the Korean War? 19%, the illiteracy rate jumps up 19%. And then finally, Vietnam War, 27%, 1973. So you have decades of schooling going on, going on, and actually what you have something is counterintuitive, and that's illiteracy is going up, not, not down. It should have gone from 2% to 0%, but it didn't, right? So as they say, we live in a capitalist society, they say, you know what they say is they follow the money, right? Like they say when you want to see what, what is behind uh, something going on, you say follow the money, right? So the actual people who uh, you know, who were interested in, in, in starting forced schooling in America are the rich. Now that's kind of surprising, right? Because who always complains about high taxes, right? It's like the rich, right? They always complain about high taxes and they're, and they're saying, why do we have to pay for, you know, these things and that things, if you're familiar with the Fraser Institute, always complaining about, you know, taxes being high, tax freedom day, etc. But, so there was some interest in them in terms of enforcing schooling and actually, uh, Rockefeller's uh, general, education, uh, 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 general, general Education Board in 1906. Remember I said that forced schooling came in 1905? So this kind of, this, this document actually explains what is really behind their intent of schooling. So I'm going to walk you through, you know, point by point uh, what, what their reasoning is. So in our dreams, so this is again R Rockefeller, the rich, talking about why they're supporting schooling. People will yield themselves with perfect doci docility to our molding hands. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children men of learning or philosophers or men of science. So the goal is not to make, the, the overall intent of the poor schooling system was not to make a learned society. So, you know, so when you saw the literacy rate drops over time, this is part of the intent. We shall not try to raise up from them authors, educators, poets, men of letters, uh, great artists, painters, musicians, nor lawyers, nor doctors, statements, politicians, creatures whom we have ample supply. So we're saying we have enough of this, and I'll talk about that when I walk through the six real principles of schooling, how that kind of works. And then here comes sort of the real sort of, uh, you know, um, the explanation factor. We'll organize children and teach them in a perfect way the things their fathers and mothers are doing in an imperfect way. So what, is he ta what are they talking about here? Like what they're doing in, in an imperfect way. If you remember the, uh, for, the, uh, for those who joined us again for the presentation, I talked about in the last presentation, was about uh, you know, labor, labor protests and the labor movement. And one of the, one of the points in labor history that was, is of significant and what Rockefeller is really referring to here is in 1877. So this came out in 1906, roughly two decades after 1877. So what happened in 1877 was there was a mass uprising, kind of like what you saw in Egypt and Tunisia, that happened in America. Right? There was like a mass uprising. People just were fed up. Because in America, the, they had sweatshop-like conditions, just like what you see in Bangladesh or China. That was America. Like, it was the same thing, right? Because you know, capitalism has a certain way of dealing with employees, and that's how it is. It's just you know, work 80 hours a week. And they had to fight to get the eight-hour workday, as, as I mentioned. So they were protesting. They were striking. They were forming rallies, right? thousands and thousands of people. So what they're talking about here is you organize children, teach them in a perfect way the things their fathers or mothers are doing in imperfect ways, referring to the fact that labor is not compliant, like they're, pro they're, they're not just doing what they're told, right? So the purpose of, of, of the overall intent of schooling is to, uh, is to create this, as it said at the outset, docility, like compliance. 
So uh, as, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, that John Taylor Gatto, what he explains is that the, there's like, you know, if you read, if you read um, Alexander Inglis's Principles of Secondary Education, he explains the six real purposes of schooling. Now in the book, if you read it, which you can read it easily online, you can go find this, uh, you know, there's a free copy on the archive.org site. It'll explain to you that, you know, their schooling is, you know, you know, to teach you to be a good citizen, blah, 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 like, you know, the usual, usual kind of stuff. But then it kind of gets into the real kind of schooling. But let me explain who Alexander Inglis is before, so you just don't think he's just some kind of Yahoo that, you know, who is this guy, right? So Alexander Inglis is actually, he was one, he's associated with Harvard. He was one of the early people in Harvard, and, you know, so, and uh, if you actually look up Inglis and Harvard and you Google that, you'll see the, the, they have an English lecture named after him. So, you know, they name, name a, a lecture that's given on education. It's, it's, it was known as the English lecture. English is also someone who comes from an elite family of the Anglo-Americans, right? His, one of his relatives, from those of us from, from the subcontinent may know, one of his relatives was actually involved in putting down the Sepoy Uprising. The Sepoy Uprising was where Muslims uh, rose up against uh, British colonial rule in India. Uh, and uh, he, it was, uh, you know, because uh, they were fighting the, uh, the occupiers. And, and he was one of the people that put him down. So he, this, is, this is a man, uh, you know, that came, that came from an elite, elite family. So the six principles are, uh, and, uh, I'll just go through the list right now and then I kind of explain each one. The ad adaptive function, integrating function, diagnostic and directive function, differentiating function, selective function, and propedeutic function. So the first one is the adaptive function. So if you look at what, uh, what Inglis wrote, so these quotes here from Inglis, and I'll kind of explain what it means in English because you know, it's written from a long time ago and you know, there's propaganda in there. Uh, so he, what he says, the adaptive function is the establishment of fixed habits of reaction. So what does he mean by fixed habits of reaction? It's obedience training. The purpose is to, is to make people obedient, right? Like when you say, go to school, and you're just, what are, you, what are you taught to do? Obey the teacher to get marks, right? So it's you t you're taught to obey a foreign person, right? If you kind of just step out for a second, you know, because we all went through schooling, most of us here went through schooling, and it's, it's kind of odd that we're ripped out of our, 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 our parents' arms kind of thing as, as little babies, and then we're sent to uh, perfect strangers and we're sent to obey them, right? So this is kind of like kind of the, how the system works is to just to create blind obedience. Second is the integrating function. And what he what he explains is the necessity of developing a certain amount of homogeneity out of a heterogeneous population for the purpose of assuring social solidarity. So what does that mean in English? It means conformity and control. The idea is that to make people conform, right? Because one of the things is that 1906, what was uh, what was happening in America again is that is that mass production was just coming about. So mass production means that there's all the same stuff is going to be produced, right? Uh, cars or whatever it is. And we all have to buy the same stuff, right? So you want people that will conform and respond to advertising. If you combine the first and the second two things together, the idea is to make everyone kind of similar so they're responsive to advertising and marketing messages. So then there's the diagnostic and directive function. Uh, each individual should do what uh, they do best. And really, this is about marks. Marks kind of drive your life, right? That's what it is, is that uh, you know, the, you know the, what you, the grades you get will sort of, will kind of determine your future and your destiny. And so that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to slot you in, in what, where do you belong. And I just want to kind of just, you know, be, being, uh, being South Asian, you know, marks are the most important things to, uh, to our parents, right? So, and I'm sure that's not just me, but a lot of people like that, especially, you know, if, uh, if you're from an immigrant family. So I just want to kind of debunk that. I know this is kind of controversial, but let's, let's go down that road anyways. Do marks really matter, right? Do marks really matter? Are they really a, a, a determinant in life? And there was an article in, 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 in McLean's that I actually asked this question. And what they said is that C plus people actually rule the world. C plus people actually rule the world. Uh, and, and, and then another question we have to ask, how can a number really determine what kind of human being you are, right? If you're an A plus student, what does that really mean? You could be a real like uh, so-and-so, like, you know, and you could be a real mean person if you get A plus, right? I don't know how many of you know people who went through law school, but the way you get through law school is you stab each other in the back, right? It's, it's well known, like what they'll do is that they'll, they'll take out books of the library and tear out the cases so that the other guy fails, right? So the people actually that rise to the top in law school, you know, they're really, uh, you know, narcissists and kind of, uh, you know, uh, type A personalities, right? So the question is what, you know, just kind of stepping back and questioning this grade system is to do that, is like, does that really define us as people? It doesn't really make sense, right? 
Does anyone know what all these people have in common besides being rich? Okay. <laughs> Does that too? Uh, they're all dropouts. They're all dropouts. Uh, uh, the, yeah, this is Ted Turner of CNN. And then there's uh, you know uh, uh, Steve Jobs, is Walt Disney, Zuckerberg, and uh, Richard Branson. All of them are dropouts. And actually, <laughs> Bill Gates, when he's honored his uh, given his uh, honorary degree. He actually rubbed it in people's faces. He said that he's Harvard's most successful dropout, right? Meaning all these other people are paying $300,000 and they're not gonna make the money that he's making, right? A anyone know who this is? This is uh, Paul Young. He owns the Hamil Hamilton Tiger Cats. Uh, he was, he's a Hamilton native born in a a Ancaster. His high, high school average is C plus. But his real claim to fame is that he started Red Hat. Red Hat is, uh, he's a billionaire who started R Red Hat and he, you know, that's how he was able to buy the Hamil Hamilton Tiger Cats, right? So, so this was, he was featured in that article. Anyone that wants that uh, link, I can, e I can email it to you about that article. Because it details a lot of Canadians. Uh, you know, Angus Reid is another example of a Canadian who dropped out. He failed English, but he started the polling, uh, you know, company, right? So, he, again, another billionaire. So, you know, so the, what, what I just, the reason why I took this detour is just to kind of, you know, kind of se separate and say, do marks really matter? And, and you can see that a lot of, there's a lot of mega successful people from a monetary perspective that didn't ha do well in school at all. So the, the question of, of grades being something that, you know, as so something sacred, that un an unquestionable ideal is something that we have to actually question. So then you have the uh, differentiating function. Uh, so then when you have the grades, you have to determine who's gonna uh, go where, right? So grades will determine whether you go to university or not, right? So that's kind of determining social efficiency. And I mean, if you look at that kind of quote there, taking advantage of the difference of, uh, differences among individuals for the purposes of determining social efficiency, it sounds very like totalitarian, right? It's like, you know, and that's, and that's what's behind the schooling kind of system, right? So, you know, the school system will sort people then you have the selective uh, function. So you have this kind of strange quote here where he's saying, no amount of tra training can ever equalize the abilities of individuals whose native capabilities defer to any market difference. And selection must inevitably be a function of the secondary education system. So this, this you have to kind of go back in that time and you have to look at uh, sort of what the kind of the Darwinian theory that was going around at that time. And this is what talks about eugenics. Does anyone here know what eugenics is? So, uh, this is something that's usually, if for, for most people who are not familiar with the term, most people associate this uh, solely with the Nazis. You know, they only, they, the Nazis had this idea that they were the master race and that, they, you know, there's other people who are inferior races like the Jews and the gypsies and things like that. But the thing is sometimes that what, what they try to do is they try to associate, they kind of disconnect the rest of Europe from being these kind of, you know, kind of, these kind of ideas of eugenics. But this is broad, broadly based in Europe. Um, there's a quote from Winston Churchill about just to, just to kind of give you an idea and context of the type of thinking that was around then. Uh, Winston Churchill, what he said uh, about when, they, when, when the British were planning to use poison gas on Muslims, I've heard some places it's in Iraq, some places it say it's in, in India, on The Guardian they said in India, but I've heard other places said they were looking at to use poison gas in Iraq. And so what Winston Churchill said in a secret memo, he says, I can't understand what's so, what's, uh, sque why people are so squeamish about using poison gas on uncivilized tribes it'll spread a lively terror, right? So what I'm trying to get at here is that Hitler's not the only one that looked down on people he considered you know, undesirable, but the British had the same kind of ideas about people like you know, basically us, right? That they thought us as uncivilized tribe and they didn't care about using poison gas on us, right? So this is the kind of idea of eugenics. Eugenics is this idea that there are people who are capable and they're the good, good they have the good genes and you have people who are the you know, low breeding genes. And so the kind of the idea is that you know, when you send people off to university, those people will, will have better stock and they'll kind of contribute to the gene pool, right? The positive gene pool. And then you have other people who are less desirable, go to college or nothing at all, just end up in a factory. And, you know, so the, you know, the lower stock kind of breeding will breed with each other. Then you have the propiedutic function. I'll just go through this quickly. Basically, what the propiedutic function is, basically, it's to... Um, raise the next level of management. Remember how he said earlier about we're going to have ample supply of the uh, you know, uh, people to take care of the system. This is where they're talking about the schooling system will partially you know, contribute to those accountants, doctors, lawyers, these types of things. So you know, what happened, right? Like if you look at Occupy, 
and you know, kind of putting this all together, and you look at kind of our current context of people in society, you look at Occupy, it was a movement. Yes, it was put down through physical violence. It was, you know, 9,000 people were arrested, so the state did use force, they did spy on them and things like that. But the movement just kind of petered out. If you, and if you compare this to like what I talked about, 1877, the people uprising, you see the massive difference that has happened amongst the people in resisting policies they seem as detrimental to themselves. Like the bank, specifically Occupy was about, you know, the, the banks running the government and, and, and taking us, basically stealing their taxpayer money. Uh, also, why, weren't, why, didn't, why wasn't there any protests about the Snowden kind of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, revelations? I mean, this is something, uh, you know, that, you know, as Muslims, we have this concept of privacy uh, in Islam. You know, your house is private. This is a well-established, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran, don't, don't, don't spy. Um, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was, uh, you know, if someone comes looking through your door, you know, you have the right to poke out his eyes, right? So that's how, how much privacy is uh, valued in Islam, right? Uh, but privacy is also an idea in the liberal democratic system is this also concept in there that you don't have the right to invade someone's privacy and if from the Snowden revelations this is a huge violation of that, right? And a lot of people have written about it but there's been no solid protest, no, like, no shutting down of the government, right? And really what it is is that it's perfect docility, right? Like the system has achieved what it was set out to do, right? It has subdued the people, right? Uh, you know, just to give you an anecdote of how effective the system is in, in making basically people into children. Um, my ex-wife, her sister, was uh, waiting for, uh, in line for an iPhone. And so she was, you know, you're waiting there for hours for the iPhone and, and then you're, you know, you're talking, she was talking to the guy behind him. Uh, and so he was explaining why he was divorced, you know. So you might be thinking, oh, it's something of fighting over money or you might be thinking, oh, uh, you know, some, you know, change in philosophies, they didn't like, you know, you know something like that happened. But it was none of these, these things. What it was, was that he was playing too much video games. This is a thing called World of Warcraft where people play like 20, you know, 20 hours straight and things like that. It's, that's why they got divorced, right? But this is, this is the, the product, he's a product of his system, right? Like he, this is a thing. And, and most of you who, I mean, I'm a little bit older so I don't have the same kind of you know, appreciation for video games. But a lot of you who are younger and can understand like a lot of your friends are how much they're into the video games. Like one brother's explained to me how he just, five hours just disappears, you know, playing uh, on the Xbox or whatever it was. So we can look at this and contrast this to uh, Islam, the Islamic education system. Uh, you know, it's egalitarian merit-based. If you notice all these scholars, Bukhari, Abu Hanifa, At-Tirmidhi, none of them are Arabs, right? So Islam never came with these kind of eugenic kind of concepts where, you know, some are better than others. The only one who's better than another was in terms of taqwa, right? Uh, piety and God consciousness. A moral character, like Islam raised people to value things such as zuhud, asceticism, fasting. You know, like one brother was telling me that at the time of Salah al-Din Ayyubi, the, you know, you were considered a bad Muslim if you didn't fast on Monday and Thursdays, right? That's, it was considered, you were considered low repute. The Ottomans had this, this system of, 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 uh, of when they uh, used to uh, collect alms, uh, you know, charity, sadaqa, where it's like, a, it's like a long bowl, right? And what it would be is that when you wanted to put, uh, you would have to put your fist in so people couldn't actually see if you were giving the money, the money because they wanted to pr 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 protect people's dignity. Right? So that's kind of like, so that you couldn't see who was taking, and all at the same time, you couldn't see who was giving either, right? So you had no idea what was going on, right? So it it's kind of shows how Islam kind of built this kind of moral uh, character in people. And it also raised activists, you know, I was actually I was here for Jummah yesterday, and the, and the brother was mentioning, just like as a, as a side comment about how this one scholar, like, got in trouble because he was, uh, uh, you know, holding the rulers accountable, right? And it's just, but this is just something uh, normal uh, in the in the uh, uh, in, in in Islam. Like it's not kind of outlandish. All the all the major scholars, Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, they all had this concept of speaking truth to power. So as I said, what is really the vision for our kids, right? How are we going to tackle this thing that the schooling system does to our kids, right? In terms of creating poor, perfect docility, that's the things that we have to address, right? Regardless of. Of the, of the schooling system that we, of how you're going to school your kids, this has to be an objective, is to build critical thinking into um, our, uh, our, our, into our kids. So some suggestions on how. So first thing and foremost is to, uh, to, 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 to train our kids to obey Allah above all things, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the things that, I mean, I'm going to my parents, this is one of the things that they sort of lay down on me. Uh, you know, as a thing beyond, like I didn't go to, I went to public school uh, and I, was, I grew up here. 
Uh, and that's just the thing is that they told me you're not obeying me when when you do this, uh, you know, thing, uh, you know, this or that. This is you're obeying Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So this is the core kind of foundation. And a good example of that is Ibrahim al Islam's story, right? Kind of like what what articulates how he looked at his society and he questioned, right? He had critical thinking, like why are people wa worshiping this inanimate stone? It makes no sense. I, like he looked at the stars and the moons and the and he looked at these things and saw that they were incapable of being the Rabb, right? And he concluded with firm conviction about, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, homeschooling is an option and I think the other brothers are going to talk about uh, their, their, how, what they have. You know, the important thing is also, as I said, to lay the vision about, uh, about your kids. If you're going to treat them like kids, they're going to be kids. If you treat them like adults, they're going to be adults. The, you know, for the story of Muhammad bin Fatih, may Allah, uh, may Allah have mercy on his soul, the one who liberated uh, Constantinople, his mother used to take him to the shore and said, you're going to liberate Constantinople. Right? So he's a product of his mother. Even Salah had the Naibi is a product of his, may Allah mercy on him as well, a product of his uncle and his father. Right? So these people are, when you look at giants in Islam, they're raised by someone, an adult who put that vision in them. And that's what we have to do as well. And the other thing is that, uh, is that we have to teach our kids not to be consumers of ideas. Right? Like when they go to school, if, if they're learning things, or just in, in, ter in terms of society, just absorbing ideas, they shouldn't, they shouldn't just absorb ideas. Like one, one good example of that is, for example, what we're taught in school is that natives just died off from disease. Natives just died off from disease. Isn't that convenient? The Europeans just come here and these people just get wiped out from disease magically, you know, and then they can just live here because there's really no moral problem then, right? Because we just came and they got smallpox from us and that's it, right? But actually, if you look into it, uh, the, the, the way the diseases were spread, they were spread on purpose. And uh, it was actually in 1763, Lord Geoffrey Amherst, uh, he was a British uh, general, uh, and he's, uh, this is where he put uh, disease into the blankets. And he said, we must extirpate this execrable race. So he had genocidal intent using biological warfare to wipe out the natives. Also, uh, what else they used to do was that they used to, uh, with the quarantine, you know, in Islam we have this concept that uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us that, you know, when, if there's a plague in the town, don't leave the town, right? So you st if there's a plague, just kind of stay there and don't go there, right? And so the Europeans adopted this concept of quarantine actually comes from Islam. And what, they, what the Europeans used to do to the natives is say, if they had diseases, don't, they told them to go visit their relatives in, in, in the sense that they would tell them to spread the diseases amongst themselves, right? So, so when, when people say uh, that the natives just died off from disease, the question is to question that concept. They question these ideas that come from school and these kind of ideas they have about society and, and men and human beings and how they should relate to each other and to sit down with our children and make them you know, critical thinkers, inshallah. So, you know, just closing is the idea is to build critical thinking. You know, school builds docility, and uh, and but we have to work to build uh, critical and uh, make our kids into activists. Because really, how our kids are going to tackle uh, and become the the future generation of Islam, like future generation of Islam, how are you going to make them leaders? How are you going to make them into? Uh, you know, the people who are going to bring the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Because that, we know that in the hadith that this victory is coming and the Ummah is going to bring it. But if we don't build these skills into our children, how is that going to happen? Jazakum uh, al-khair. And I'm, the next one is Abdul